Hello, my friends. This is Chris Oatley. I'm a Disney character designer who answers your questions about concept art and illustration at chrisoatley.com. I get a lot of questions about rendering. Artists write me and want to know how to put a strong level of finish on their paintings. And so I decided to do an epic super post about <laughs> one element of rendering, which is texture. This video is only one third of the super post, and you can find the whole thing at chrisoatley.com forward slash Hudson River. There you can read a horror story and a history lesson that support the, the concepts taught in this video, and you can also download a PDF version of the article so you can share it with your friends very easily, read it on your mobile device, etc. Rendering is complex. It's, uh, it's about light, it's about detail, it's about composition, it's about a lot of different things, but texture is obviously a big part of rendering. And so we're going to learn from some of history's masters of texture, the painters of the Hudson River School. Now, again, for some context about uh, who the painters of the Hudson River School were, you should go to chrisotley.com forward slash Hudson River. Now, if rendering is such a complex concept, why did I decide to start with texture? Well, there absolutely is a reason. People send me links to their art all the time, and occasionally I, I have a minute where I can go check it out. And I also go and surf DeviantArt and conceptart.org and all these places where people post their art so I can stay in touch with the current state of the art of digital painting. And, well, and traditional too, but uh, obviously it's mostly digital now, and for better or worse, that's the way things are. And one of the most common problems that I see with digital art uh, all across the internet is, is texture that is just out of control. And it's very easy for your texture to get out of control when you're working digitally because things move so much faster and you don't have to earn texture like you did back when we were painting with oils and acrylics and watercolor and so forth. You just paste in a photo texture and convert that to multiply or overlay if you're working in Photoshop, or you make a couple quick strokes with a texture brush and all of a sudden you have texture overload in your painting. So our paintings can get out of control very, very quickly. And when this happens, that's what I call the texture monster. When your textures just attack and <laughs> devour your entire painting, that's the texture monster. So how do you fight the texture monster? How do you protect your paintings from its attack? Well, you will need three ancient weapons. Uh, weapons that were expertly wielded by the Hudson River painters. And those three weapons are atmosphere, scale, and shadow. Now, there are other weapons with which you can defend against the texture monster, but I believe that if you focus on mastering these three, they will have an immediate and significant impact on your paintings and grant more power to you as a painter and a visual communicator. In case you didn't know already, or in case you hadn't figured it out by now, we've been looking at paintings by the Hudson River School painters. And we've gone through all seven paintings that we're going to look at in this video, and we're going to jump back now to the beginning and look at Shandaken Range by Asher Brown Durand. This is a beautiful painting with a heck of a lot of texture and detail. This is something that I love about the Hudson River painters. They marched right up to the texture monster's front door and yelled, bring it on. Uh, they taunted the texture monster. They didn't, they didn't just hide from it. And of course, I'm referring to the tremendous amount of texture and detail in their paintings. This romantically stylized realism is common uh, with the paintings of the Hudson River School. Durand used all of the weapons to fight the texture monster in this painting, but the one that's most prominently demonstrated is atmosphere. Take note first of the golden yellow hue that is everywhere in the painting. The foreground, the midground, the background. The, the painting is almost monochromatic. The main separator is the sense of atmosphere, this cool white color that you see right here. Note how the white of the atmosphere, the cool white of the atmosphere, creates a gradient across the midground from from the distant background, which you bear you can barely make out those 
distant mountains back there. And then it creates the gradient across the mid-ground, mid which connects the, the distant mountains to the foreground here. Okay? So the white acts as a separator and as a connector. And that is primarily what gives the painting such a great sense of depth, which is amazing given that the painting is so monochromatic. But it's not just color that creates a sense of atmosphere in this painting. It's also the texture itself. The painter is achieving something referred to as atmospheric perspective. Atmospheric perspective has two aspects. One aspect is the one that we've already established, which is the farther away a form is from the viewer, and of course you are the viewer looking through this window of the canvas into the world of the painting, the farther away a form is from the viewer, the more it takes on the color of the atmosphere. Sometimes you can think about the color of the atmosphere and the color of the sky as being the same thing, and Shandaken Range is definitely, that's definitely the case here with this painting. That's not always the case, so you can't always count on it, but um, that is a, that's a really good, quick and dirty way to, uh, to start thinking about it. The second aspect to atmospheric perspective is the farther away a form is from the viewer, the less detailed it is, or more specifically, the more the atmosphere obscures the detail of the form. Okay, so look at these distant mountains, the farthest thing visible from the viewer, far farthest things from the viewer, you can barely even tell they're there. They're giant mountains with that are covered in trees and rocks and whatever else, animals and uh, water and and whatever. But uh, but they're they're very very they're almost invisible. They're very obscured. And then as we move closer, it's a little more visible. But still, there are these huge groupings of trees that are they, there's almost no detail. It's almost just sort of a, a singular shape, but you can just barely kind of see a little bit of variation, both in color and in value. And then as we move up into the mid-ground now, we can start to see the trees become a little bit more distinctive. There's still not any, it's, it's, you're not able to detect any individual leaves or blades of grass, but you're starting to be able to see some variation in the texture. You can start to make out that there's a rock form here surrounded by some trees and, and so on. Then we move up into the uh, the the big you know the foreground of the middle ground the front of the middle ground the closest part of the middle ground, and you can see we see this uh, little creek here and the rocks and if we zoom in we can even see some uh, little bushes or as you know maybe those are cl little clusters of of long grass. You can see here's some rocks, here's some uh, some sort of little bush, here's a rock formation here sticking out of the ground. You know, it, things start to become uh, much more uh, distinctive. The forms become much more distinctive. And then finally, in the foreground, we can see everything in full detail. One thing I want to point out about atmospheric perspective is how it can be cheated. This can work when you're doing just a singular character painting or uh, an environment or even a prop or something. And, and that is that as you, um, you that, that you can kind of caricature or exaggerate atmospheric perspective uh, even in wh where it might not be fully present or fully detectable in real life, but because you're a painter, that's, that's part of the job of the painter is to make those kinds of stylistic decisions. Uh, earlier, I referred to the Hudson River painter's uh, style, I guess, uh, as romantically stylized realism. And, uh, and here's what I mean by that. Notice how this tree has, the, the texture is just very, very prominent in that tree. It's, it, it's slightly more intense as, on the side that the light is hitting it. So as you go into the area of shadow, although the shadow is very light, the texture is a, just a little bit more obs, uh, obscure, just slightly more obscure, just slightly less prominent. But then there's this tree going through here behind this one. So look what Asher Brown Durand does here because he wants you to see this tree first. He wants this tree to be more distinctive and obviously more forward because it's overlapping that one behind it. He goes and, and right here 
he's actually having the texture be a little bit more rich on this tree, but then as it moves into the shadow behind this tree, the texture kind of tapers off and almost disappears entirely. And then as it moves out from behind the tree, it becomes a little bit more prominent, but still much less prominent than any texture on this tree. Isn't that interesting? So he manages to use atmospheric perspective even with two trees that are basically right next to each other. This is what I mean when I'm always talking about uh, how painters need to make decisions. You're always making decisions and everything's a decision. And as easy as it would be to look at this painting and say, oh, that's a realistic painting, it's actually not. There are all kinds of stylized decisions being made, really sophisticated decisions being made uh, with texture and with atmosphere and color. This painting is called Among the Sierra Nevada Mountains, and it's by Albert Bierstadt. And the thing I want to point out here is how the atmosphere changes color with the light. You'll notice the sky color is actually a lavender color. And then there's the complementary bright yellow that is indicative of the sunlight. And uh, then everything else is basically a gradient in between those two extremes, those two complements which creates this nice glowing purple gray in the shadows. You can also see it here and reflected in the water. You can see it up here. You can also see the bounce light from the sky being caught by the fog that is collecting on the ground back there to help. That's also creating a light source, which is helping to push these trees forward while keeping them under control. The mist, of course, from the waterfalls catches it. And uh, again, that's just the bounce light from the sky. So the shadow picks it up because the shadow is blocking out that bright golden light, that intense light from the sun. And the only light that it's catching is the, the weaker and softer diffuse uh, bounce light from the sky. So ultimately, the atmosphere reacts to the light. The atmosphere contains or catches the light. Not only does it tint the forms and obscure the forms as the, as the density of the atmosphere increases, it can also be designed, uh, he, as Albert Bierstadt did here. He designed the atmosphere to direct the eye of the viewer and emphasize a certain you know, visual statement that he was trying to make about the heavenly godlight coming down from the uh, from the sun through the clouds and uh, and kind of painting the uh, landscape with this golden hue. I also welcome you to revisit this painting after we've gone through the lesson on shadow. I have, uh, I've picked out other paintings that will help to demonstrate uh, the use of shadow, but, uh, but this one does it too. So come back to this and analyze how atmosphere and shadow can actually be used together as they are in this painting. So what do you do when uh, you want to paint an environment that lacks atmosphere or it just doesn't have a very dense atmosphere? Perhaps a, uh, an environment with a cold, dry climate like the one right in front of us. This painting is Cathedral Rocks Yosemite Valley, Winter by Albert Bierstadt. And this painting does make use of atmospheric perspective, so don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that there's absolutely no use of atmosphere in this painting, it's just that atmosphere is not the primary weapon being used to fight the texture monster. The primary weapon uh, being used to fight the texture monster in this painting is scale, or more to the point, textural scale. Now I will explain what I mean by that. Because Bierstadt wanted to paint an environment with a cold, dry climate, he had to rely on textural scale in a way that was similar to the way he relied on atmosphere in Among the Sierra Nevada Mountains, the painting we just looked at. Just like atmosphere, there are two aspects to textural scale. There's the simple aspect, which is, is the texture that you are applying to a form the correct scale, the appropriate scale for that form. In other words, are your textures too big? Are your textures too small? To describe that form accurately and to communicate where that form sits uh, within the space of the world that you are creating in your painting. The next aspect of textural scale is a comparative scale. In other words, Bierstadt puts a tree here, and then he puts a tree here, and then he puts a tree here, and then he puts trees here, and then he puts trees way, way up here, super teeny little trees, and it gives you the sense of perspective. We know about how big a tree is. Sure, we know there's ones that are, are a, they vary in size, but more or less, these trees are all 
when you're talking about in comparison to this giant mountain, they're all about the same size. And so it's that scale that he uses to connect the foreground to the distant background. Also, he uses shadow, which uh, we're going to talk about last. Uh, but again, come back, revisit this painting, and look at how Bierstadt used textural scale and shadow and a little bit of atmosphere all to fight the texture monster for this painting. In the Texture Monster Super Post at chrisotley.com, I use this painting, The Oxbow by Thomas Cole, uh, to teach the same lesson that I was just teaching with the Bierstadt uh, Cathedral Rocks painting. Uh, there is a, a greater sense of atmosphere in this painting. You can see how the distant uh, mountains recede just like they were receding in Shandaken Range. Um, here's the mid-ground receding. But for the most part, there's a, a, the atmosphere is pretty thin uh, over here to contrast the very dense atmosphere to the point where it's not even really atmosphere anymore. It's rain <laughs> on this side of the painting. But again, we have this dense thick texture to bring our attention to the foreground and give us this sense that here's a strong shadow to give us just this sense of depth uh, that la is lacking back here as the atmosphere takes over. Also, there's some textural scale in this, almost like this perspective grid that ends up happening with the, uh, the sheets of rain that are coming down. It's like one half of a just a traditional two-point perspective grid. Of course, it's lacking over here, but, but it's happening here. Also here with the trees. Now we're looking at Rocky Cliff by Asher Brown Durand, and this is my second favorite of the paintings I'm going to show you today. This painting uses texture in the perspective grid kind of way because the, the, the texture on the rocks here turns just like, almost like a chicken wire mesh from a CG model. You see how it does that? How it gives us this sense of perspective by using the kind of the grid lines from the rock. And then again, same deal, we have trees, tree trunk here, smaller trees, smaller trees, smaller trees. So you have a sense of depth here. Here's some more trees. And uh, then we have these leaves up close, smaller leaves, smaller leaves. So this is something to keep in mind when you're painting, is how does the texture wrap around the form if it does at all? How does it describe the contour of the form. When you're trying to really render out a painting, when you're trying to put a, a high level of, of detail, a high level of finish into your painting, you can't just describe forms with uh, a 2D contour. Well, you can. This distant mountain back here is basically just a 2D outline. But if you want to give a sense of depth, you're going to have to commit to a three-dimensional contour as well as a two-dimensional contour. So it's not enough to just get the outline right. You have to get the three-dimensional contour as well. Here's another painting by Albert Bierstadt. This is called A Rocky Mountain View. And this is a similar, there's a similar intent here with this painting as there was with Among the Sierra Nevada Mountains, and that is to direct your attention to this epic sky and the way that the light is breaking through the clouds and hitting the mountains. So Bierstadt frames his vision with the foreground itself. And how does he do that? Well, he casts the foreground almost entirely in shadow. Can you imagine if the light were coming from the front? This group of trees would just become a caustic mess in front of this textural kind of, I guess these are the foothills here in front of the mountains. This ground here would start to flatten out against the group of foothills there. But he also wants to maintain, obviously, a foreground, otherwise you won't have the sense of scale and the sense of depth. So uh, so what does he do? Well, he casts it all in shadow. And I've also mentioned shadow several times throughout this tutorial, and so you can go back and look at how uh, the artists are using shadow to group forms together to make them serve their purpose within the composition and yet to diminish their importance in the painting itself and to direct uh, the focus to some other aspect of the painting. And here's one more because it's my favorite of all the paintings we're looking at today. This is probably my favorite painting from the Hudson River School, in fact. This is 
Natural Bridge, Virginia by Frederick Edwin Church. And this is just such a nice, there's so much to say about this painting that I won't go into now. It just makes such great use of all three texture monster weapons, none as uh, emotionally, none as romantically as Shadow. I just love how the graphic form of the mountain is blended together with this giant tree here, which gives you a sense of scale, but doesn't it's, it's because it's cast in shadow, it doesn't di distract from the point of the painting, which is to highlight the natural bridge itself. And uh, here's another giant tree in shadow, and then this beautiful little pool of light just conveniently landing right on the two uh, human characters down there, which gives you, of course, again, just such a tremendous sense of scale of how big this natural bridge really is. And uh, what a uh, just a beautiful painting uh, to end on there. If you like the content in this video, you should head to digitalpaintingkit.com where you can download my free digital painting kit, which includes free Photoshop brushes, custom brushes that I designed, and free photo textures that you can use now uh, uh, with your newfound knowledge of how to control texture and how to fight the texture monster. There's also an email mini course that you'll get in your inbox uh, that is called The Key to Great Paintings, which takes you through all of the stuff that you should be thinking about long before you think about rendering. And uh, also, there are often industry job announcements, uh, some of them exclusive to the newsletter, in fact, and those have been a big hit. So again, digitalpaintingkit.com. Head there and subscribe to the email newsletter. You get all that stuff and, uh, and the email mini course as well. And one more time, chrisoatley.com forward slash Hudson River will take you to the super post where, where you'll get the supplemental material that supports the lessons in this video. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time, go well.